the I'll, I'll talk about the defense relationship with Russia, which is virtually the only relationship there is between the United States and Russia, the political and economic being uh, much attenuated. Uh, the military one is attenuated also in positive ways that we once upon a time uh, had more of. Um, uh, and I'll just say, before I say what I'm going to say about Russia, which is uh, uh, um, requ what I'm going to say is that we're, we're required to be stand strong uh, against today's Russia, uh, and that was what I thought was important as Secretary of Defense, uh, and also what I uh, uh, advised and supported within NATO as well. Uh, that isn't, hasn't always been the case, and just so you know where I'm coming from, I know a different time uh, in the 1990s, and Joe was a big part of this, Liz was a big part of this, uh, where I worked very closely with the Russians, including the Russian military. Uh, I had responsibility for the Nun Lugar program, uh, which was our way of contributing to a really Russian-led effort to secure the weapons of mass destruction legacy of the former Soviet Union. Uh, and we're very proud of our role in that, but the, the, the ones who get credit for that are principally the military and the custodians uh, in Russia and the other states who rose to the solemnity of the duty of being custodians of nuclear weapons and nuclear materials uh, and the gravity of that responsibility in those days and to whom the world owes a very great deal. Uh, we worked with them closely, um, but it was, a, it was their accomplishment, not ours, it was theirs. Uh, I worked with, uh, and I have great pictures of Liz and I with Pavel Grachov, the defense minister of Russia in the 90s when we successfully engineered a way to get the Russians to be part of K4 in Kosovo, um, a, uh, a way that um, worked for our and uh, NATO's important military principle of unity and command, uh, unity of command, while meeting Russia's political need not to be seen to be uh, totally subordinated to NATO. Uh, we went through the difficult period, and I know this is one of the things that was in, sent to me as a question or still being discussed. I, I, there's almost no point in talking about it now. It's long in the past, but uh, about NATO enlargement, I'll just say two things about it. It's, again, it's long. I, I <coughs> personally um, uh, would have favored and did favor some delay and long, a longer period of partnership for peace. For those of you who remember what partnership for peace uh, was, that would have been a wiser course. Uh, it was not the course taken. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, it became, uh, NATO's enlargement became a lasting source of grievance, much exploited by Vladimir Putin in the years since. Uh, and also, from a military point of view, exposed us uh, as a defensive alliance on the flanks in a, uh, a way that's very hard to compensate for, and we, are, 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 we work very hard at doing that, and I think there are ways that we can do that, um, but it's not a pleasant military challenge to, to have. We find ourselves, therefore, in the circumstances now of Vladimir Putin, a substantial climate of grievance um, and a very definite point of view, which has some sense to it here and there, uh, but a very definite point of view on his part, uh, which he shares freely. I, I've frequently asked, and Joe, you and Liz and others may, may be as well, what is Vladimir Putin thinking? And it's a favorite question to ask. And my answer is, you don't need to, you don't need to ask me. You know, you guys just listen to him. It tells you exactly what he's thinking. Um, 
and he has, there's the grievance point, there is the view that the United States has made a hash of things. This is particularly true in the Middle East. I have a good friend, Boogie Alon, the defense minister formerly of Israel, who was fond of saying that it's easy to make an omelet out of an egg and very hard to make an egg out of an omelet. And so when you take apart a country, uh, even with the best of intentions, uh, you quickly find that uh, you have unleashed things that are very difficult to contain. Putin makes that point uh, insistently. And, and so in most cases, I can see the reason behind what he is, he is up to. And you could think of a way of building a bridge to that, uh, which is very difficult to build. The motivation of his that it's it, very difficult to build a bridge to, and I never succeeded, uh, and I don't think it's possible, uh, is the motivation that takes satisfaction from thwarting the United States as an end in its own right. And obviously, it's hard to <laughs> uh, build a bridge to that kind of motivation. And he definitely has that. That being the case, uh, I, what I, the phrase I used as Secretary of Defense was strong and balanced. Our strategy towards Russia, strength, um, and uh, that means having, it means a lot of things, but one of them, for example, is having for the first time in a quarter century a, a plan to go to war with Russia, which we kind of didn't have for 25 years, and we do now. Um, and that's not something we discuss a lot, but it's, it's, it, is, it is a necessity of current times. True for NATO as well. This is not a rewriting of the playbook of the Cold War. That wouldn't be appropriate. It's not the fold gap, and it's a new playbook that, it, that takes into account hybrid warfare and little green men phenomena and lots of cyber and lots of other things that are characteristic of modern warfare and the exposed flanks. Uh, for that matter. It means in our own uh, investment programs doing things that are specifically oriented towards um, the defeat of Russian weapon systems. Again, not something we did for quite a while. And of course, we had a tremendous preoccupation with counterinsurgency and counterterrorism for 15 years or returning to great power roots. Whole other story on China, Iran, North Korea, and others as well, but certainly Russia's uh, among them, um, and uh, uh, some uh, positioning of U.S. forces in NATO in uh, new and different ways. That's the U.S. unilateral side, and then for NATO, um, uh, putting Russia and deterrence of Russian aggression solidly on the NATO map, again, not something that was on NATO's radar screen, and part of its story of why it existed, it would say, well, that's not why we exist. We exist because of Afghanistan or something like that. Or we exist because of Kosovo. Now it exists because of Russia. And NATO's willing to say that. Uh, and I think that's important and it's necessary. And at the same time, of course, NATO's about other things. It's still about Afghanistan. It's about its southern flank. Um, but it's about the eastern flank uh, as well. Uh, so that's strength, and it all starts there. And uh, Joe was asking me earlier something you may want to ask uh, later about the Russian cyber intrusions. Um, but uh, uh, this is now a necessity of our time uh, in, in defense and within <coughs> NATO. Balanced, because I always try to hold open and in, when I spoke publicly and when I talked to Russians about this, the possibility that where we found common interest, we would be willing to work together. We're realistic. Uh, we need to be realistic. Uh, those are few and far between. A little bit on Iran in the nuclear area. Um, uh, successfully, I thought, the Russians did the right thing. Uh, in the old days, North Korea, they're not, Russians aren't very helpful now and actually don't matter as much as they wish they did. Um, but other than that, you know, certainly Syria, don't get me started, I'll tell you stories on Syria, uh, Ukraine, uh, war in general, and the threats of war, uh, brandishing nuclear weapons, building odd and, and 
weird new types and numbers of nuclear uh, weapons speaking in a way that Leonid Brezhnev never would have about nuclear weapons and that leaders in the nuclear age generally have not. Um, and of course, hacking the US presidential election, which they, which they damn well did. Uh, I mean, tried to do. Uh, their level of success is murkier. Uh, and the involvement of Americans in it is a whole other question. But what's absolutely clear is that they tried. Uh, so all that is a pretty big hill to climb for those who want to do something in U.S.-Russian relations. At the same time, I do, uh, uh, I think it's important to hold the door open, uh, however conditionally. And um, so strong and balanced is the way to go. That was what I tried to do. We'll see what the new crowd uh, does. I don't think they've settled down to anything that is intelligible yet. Uh, and we'll just have to, well, we'll just have to see what comes out uh, of that. There hasn't been much policy making with respect to Russia. I don't imagine there will be soon. Um, because the Mueller investigation, I think, makes it very difficult to move. Um, Ash, the, when it comes to deterring Russia, uh, we know how to do conventional deterrence, uh, you know, putting in an extra brigade and having them sort of toe to heel in the Baltics. Uh, that's something we know how to do, and it seems to have had some effect. Do we know how to deter Russian involvement in Western elections and politics? This came up in the uh, lunch session with foreign, former Foreign Minister Anna Palacio and the question of whether the Russians were messing about in Catalonia. We know that they were messing about in our 2016 election. How do we deter that? Well, it's, it's, it's a very good question, Joe, and I think the the basics of it are that it, that is not a question that can be answered ad adequately within the f its own frame. Mm -hmm. uh, the only way that you can uh, 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 respond to and thereby deter actions by Russia is by having the, a, a wider uh, defense and deterrence policy uh, than the one we have now. And you, you do these things where, where there's a larger context of strength and um, ability to dole out threats and rewards. When you have attenuated that, you, to the point that it is now attenuated, our toolbox is, I mean, everybody wants to respond. At, yeah. want the, you're not asking this, Joe, but the standard thing people want when they ask that question is, tell me the cyber thing I should do in response to a cyber thing. I'm not a cyber for cyber person. Uh, somebody attacks the United States, they've attacked the United States. I don't care whether you did it with cyber or not. And I don't confine myself, and I, we don't confine ourselves in our military thinking to a cyber response. You might get anything. Um, uh, to do that while keeping peace that is outside of war, uh, you need to be operating from a richer pattern of uh, strength and interaction than we are now. So the answer is it's difficult to stop them from doing any one particular thing unless you have the pattern. Could the Obama pattern have done more in... Yes. Yeah. 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 No, no, no question. Uh, it's not a criticism. You can always do more. Um, and if Liz had still been in her job right up until the other end, she was over running the Department of Energy, I dare say we would have. No, uh, no in all seriousness, yes, you, yeah, yes. Uh, yeah, and do you mean specifically in connection About with the, the election? About the 2016, yeah. Oh, sh I, I mean, I, people ask me this all the time, uh, too, and I, I, the answer to that is, uh, the question is, has the U.S. government done enough, either the previous administration or this administration? Uh, no. And uh, uh, proof, look at Vladimir Putin. The man is the proof. Uh, does this guy look like he's, allowed, he's learned any lessons from, from this? So the question to answer, you don't need to ask an American that question. You just l look at Vladimir Putin. Does it look like he has learned his lessons from, from Obama or Trump uh, about this? No, of course not. And that's so we haven't done enough. Um, 
but again, you don't you don't accumulate that kind of leverage in a narrow channel. Right. That's a, that's a mistake. That's why you have to have a broader strategy. Right. Uh, let's throw it open since we're short on time. Uh, yes. Sorry, how the United States uh, sees the danger, how you, when you were in sure. the Defense Department, what kind of a danger you see of the Soviet, I'm sorry, you can tell where I am, <laughs> um, uh, the Russian position in Syria, and really what, uh, what, how we can respond to it. it, it it's a Soviet position in Syria, <laughs> Thank you. The, the, the short answer. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, let's go back. The, 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 uh, to the Russian blundering into Syria in the first place. Uh, and just tell the story of that, and then we'll wind up to the future. The Russians came in, if you'll remember, saying that they were going to fight ISIS and move Assad aside. That is, promote a political transition. They didn't do either of those things. Uh, they lied uh, and did and didn't do what they said they were, they were going to do. They lied to me personally, by the way. Uh, and um, uh, so, first of all, they didn't have any role in, and any constructive role at all, in the defeat of ISIS, which is now almost complete in Iraq and Syria. That's, the United States did that. And it's, and it's, by the way, NATO allies, a whole other issue about whether NATO Qua NATO participated. That's a became a, a victim of theology, but the NATO countries did, uh, and very um, ably. Uh, no other country could have done that but us, and we did it with the Sir our Syrian and Iraqi allies and friends. By the way, who first get the first credit? Uh, the Russians didn't have anything to do with that. Uh, and they haven't moved Assad aside. They've turbocharged him and thereby prolonged the Syrian civil war. Uh, so uh, that's what they said they were going to do, and that's what they did. Uh, that was evident to me immediately, which is why I opposed any efforts to get us associated. They were desperate to associate the United States with this misadventure and tried to bait the United States into various kind of, uh, kinds of associations uh, with it. Um, and uh, President Obama did a sensible thing, uh, which is uh, conditioned uh, any kind of such association on them doing what they were supposed to be doing. And of course, they never met those conditions, and so it did. So he, so he handled it. Uh, he handled it uh, uh, very well. But I, I, I adamantly opposed that because you could see the trick uh, right in front. They wanted us to be morally and politically complicit in their misadventure. Uh, today, uh, now with the uh, uh, defeat of. ISIL and their destruction in Mosul and Raqqa, and therefore essentially the destruction of the idea as well as the fact that there can be an Islamic state uh, based upon you know, barbarism of this sort. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the attention with respect to that, I think, needs to turn to the political and economic aftermath. I've been concerned for a long time, and I was saying this a year ago, by which time I was confident that we were sort of, we knew exactly how we were going to do this, and I could more or less see the timetable, though I never spoke about the timetable, because when I get talk about timetables in war is a dangerous thing to do. Um, I, I, I always talked about the military campaign is going to outrun the political and economic campaign, and, and uh, I'm, uh, that's my principal concern at this juncture. Um, part of that is the fate of Syria and the Russian adventure uh, uh, in Syria. 
uh, they show no signs of having learned any particular lessons uh, in, that, in that regard. I think we are in a much stronger position, uh, having won the war, having our people having won the war, our people being, I'll, who he wouldn't like it said this way, and so I don't mean it this way, but um, uh, those like Prime Minister Abadi in Baghdad who bet upon the United States and also bet upon multi-sectarianism for Iraq have won in the eyes of their own people. And there's nothing like winning to validate leadership. And um, so, yes, there's Iranian influence in Baghdad, and yes, there are Russians screwing around down in the, in the Dar Azur type area down the lower Euphrates Valley. Um, uh, but we're in a much stronger position because we're the winners uh, against ISIS, and uh, the, the Russians are still mired in the uh, Syrian uh, civil war. So that's the, that's the story there. It's not over. It's not done. Uh, and the Russians are, um, you know, I think blundering about, and it's another area where we need to stand strong, and you can't be associated with it. Question in this second row here. Yeah. All right, here comes the mic. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Jed Schwartz from Somerville. Uh, it, it would seem that uh, uh, a, a members of a national, extra national uh, group interfering, I mean, lobbying or, or campaigning in a the, the electoral camp uh, affairs of a different country is okay if it's legal, that is, if it's above board. Uh, 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 that being the case, uh, how, how do you interpret uh, uh, citizens versus United, the, the citizens versus United case. Uh, I mean, how, how doesn't that case make it very difficult to distinguish between, uh, uh, say, the funds of Americans and the funds of uh, Russians? To be blunt, I mean, if you can't, if those the, the sources, the ownership of the funds coming into the campaign, are 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 not. Uh, in the public sphere are are protected. Then how can how is it possible for anyone to distinguish Russian uh, financial influences upon the campaign? Well, I mean, look, two wrongs don't make a right. So I'm not I'm not a big I'm a big lover of the way we do campaign funding. Uh, you, you see, um, you're not. <laughs> I'm not a big lover. Oh, of, no, that, no, that was no, the point no. I was trying. So, to. so so I'm not happy with Americans buying disproportionate influence, but at least they're not Russian. Yeah. Um, so one doesn't excuse the other. And these, this is the Russian government manipulating the American people. Now, our government has a responsibility to protect our people. Uh, and uh, it didn't discharge that responsibility in this case, and it needs to. It's, that's what our, that was not, that, not the Defense Department, but that's what law enforcement and intelligence and Homeland Security uh, are supposed to do. And this is an unwelcome and untoward um, intrusion upon our country by a foreign country. And that's one of the reasons you pay your taxes is that so your government stops that kind of thing. Can we get the mic over to our director? <laughs> yes. Thank you, Joe. Um, you haven't mentioned Europe um, uh, in the last half an hour, and I wonder... I haven't mentioned Europe. Well, <laughs> That's an odd thing to say. <laughs> uh, I have, several times. Well, I mean, you talk about Eastern flank and so on, but, uh, but you, you didn't mention Europe as a political actor. Uh, uh, is this game only U.S.-Russia game, or we have some other actors on whom we can count? Uh, whom we can encourage to do certain things, uh, whom we should disregard. Uh, what's, what's the thinking about that uh, part of the well, story? I think you're going to be happy with what I say, which <laughs> is that I, I, you know we shouldn't disregard uh, Europeans, and I apologize if I gave any such impression. Uh, I don't, and I, I've, I'm a huge friend of NATO. Uh, I think NATO 
and and I I I the the I think the attacks on NATO, um, which I hope have been now sort of a, a kind of <laughs> passing storm, but you can never tell. Um, uh, we're unwarranted. Uh, and uh, Europe, if you, I, I frequently say to people, if, you, if, it ta if you're an American, I say to my fellow Americans, take a globe, spin the globe, and say, where on earth do you find people that share much of what you think is valuable in life and worth defending in the first place? And Europe's not the only place, but... <laughs> You know, the finger will 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 go to Europe, and I realize that makes invidious comparisons with other par parts of the world, but that's the way it is. Uh, the way they conduct themselves, the way they govern themselves, um, and uh, principles that we are mutually wedded to. Uh, I also believe that. Uh, Europe is immensely powerful. Do I wish they spent more on defense? Yes, and I join a long string of American defense leaders who have largely fruitlessly, uh, you know, banged our spoon on our high chair about the need for more money to be spent um, uh, by Europeans on their own defense, and I regret that. Still and all, uh, every time we have asked Europe to join us in a serious defense of civilization. And every time they have asked us, we both ponied up, whether it be immediate aftermath of 9-11, Afghanistan, uh, Bosnia, Kosovo. Um, and the performance has been terrific. Uh, I see a few of you here who know this perfectly well, but when it comes to Syria, Iraq, uh, Northern Africa, uh, South Saharan Africa, uh, wherever you go uh, around the world, the, the performance of NATO forces working with U.S. forces has been exceptional. Uh, in their military capabilities and in the way they conducted themselves. Dimitri? Thank you very much for this very insightful, um, all these insightful comments. But I'm a little confused because by listening to you referring to Syria and Iraq, one would get the impression that we are dealing with a great success on the part of the U.S. foreign and defense policy, and one might dispute that. Um, well, so the one is you, so why don't you go ahead? Right. <laughs> well, I'm not necessarily endorsing the dispute, but I'm just conveying. <laughs> so uh, in Iraq, one might say that it is Iran uh, that is calling the shot and not uh, the United States. And we've seen that with Kirkuk recently. So I want to comment there. I also want to comment on the Kurdish issue and the recent developments there on the part of the US. And finally, as I am Greek and coming from Greece, a comment on the rapid deterioration in U.S.-Turkish relations. And <laughs> Turkey is a member of NATO. It can create problems in NATO where decisions are consensus-based. as the largest, second largest land army in NATO. And so how do you see things in this very difficult triangle of Turkey, yeah. Middle East, Kurds, and the rest? Thank you. Very, very good questions. And um, to the point about Iran, you're right that Iraq remains in play uh, as between Iranian influence and other influence, including the US influence. And the victory against ISIS does not put that to rest. You're absolutely right. It does, however, much advantage the United States, not Iran. And Abadi, not the Maliki types in Baghdad. So it doesn't dispose of the matter, but it, it, it strengthens our hand. But one would be foolish not to recognize that Baghdad uh, 
uh, southeastern Syria are places that are in play. Uh, and I certainly acknowledge that. Uh, but we've got to get in the game uh, to protect our own friends and our protect, protect our own uh, interests. So that's, that, that is far from over. Uh, the Kirkuk thing is, a, is a, I have a very close interpretation of because I, I, I dealt with Prime Minister Abadi and President Barzani constantly uh, over a couple of years. And it's an inherently tense relationship, we all know. Uh, <clears throat> and starting two years ago, or a little over two years ago, when I put together the plan mm -hmm. for the taking of Mosul, and of course, that, this is like we were nowhere. Ramadi had fallen. The, Irani, the, the, the Iraqi security forces were in disarray. They had basically walked out of Ramadi. So it was gonna be a long slog, and I knew that of rebuilding the Iraqi armed forces, um, which we eventually did, and built the brigades that would then slowly work their way up the Tigris River Valley and Ramadi to Heat, Rupa, Fallujah, and so forth, up into Makmur and Kiar, and eventually the envelopment of Mosul and the taking of Mosul. Uh, it was necessary part of our plan that from the north, the Peshmerga, uh, the KRG Peshmerga, uh, also participate, and that the two forces be able to work together. There was a period in the campaign, for, for example, when the Iraqi security forces, which were wheeling um, left, <coughs> uh, uh, eastward and northward of, of Mosul were passing through the Peshmerga lines down towards ISIL. I went to, in last October, I don't know when, um, to a, a, a Kurdish base, air base, and there were Iraqi aircraft operating out of that Kurdish. I mean, imagine that. Now that was built, that was based upon month after month after month of constant conversation with those two people. And they said, how can we trust one another? And I said, you, I don't expect you to trust one another, but trust me. And I'll make sure everybody sticks to the rules. This is the plan, you don't get to keep what you take. Uh, and uh, that, that's kind of the deal. And otherwise, I'll cut you off. And uh, that worked, uh, that, that worked. I don't know how, it was always gonna be dodgy at the end, because Mosul's a complicated place, by the way. It's not just Kurds and, and um, uh, the Iraqi security forces there. It's got Yazidis and Turkmen and Christians, and it's a bit complicated place. Um, uh, unusual sectarian mix. It was going to be and is a complicated thing. Uh, uh, but they stuck together, and it came a little bit unglued in association with what I thought was an ill-advised calling for a referendum by uh, Barzani. I, I didn't think that was a wise thing to do. It had the predictable consequences. Uh, and now I think our folks, I certainly hope they are, my successors are trying to get this back in the box and get everybody to, 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 to calm down. But that's, the Iranian, you, you made it an Iranian thing, it's really not, it's an Erbil versus Baghdad thing. And that's all very understandable. The Iranian, the militias, remember the militias, the, the Shia militias come in two flavors. There are those that fall underneath a body and his command and control and are paid by them, which we don't love, but that's, they, they, he did successfully assert control over them, and they operate in accordance with his plans and in a non-sectarian manner. They don't do a whole lot, but that's okay too. The Iranian associated militias didn't had no role whatsoever in defeating ISIS. They ride around behind the lines, flying their flags and giving press conferences. Uh, and so they're basically useless. 
And so I think they create a larger image than is warranted of them, Hadi al Amri and those guys. Um, and so, uh, and I think that they were not part of a victory, and therefore the victory, in fact, sidelines them rather than if they had delivered the victory to the Iraqi people, that would be a serious problem. Uh, no, sorry, Ash, we had promised to get you out of here five minutes ago. But thank you very thank you much for very much. taking your time. Turkey is a whole other question. <laughs> Thanks very much, Joe. Appreciate it. That's great. So we'll, we'll now have part two of the afternoon session. And uh, uh, we're joined, as Ash pointed out, by two people who were smarter than I am, but at least I have them <laughs> flanking me. No so way. I was say the flanking is different <laughs> on this. In any case, the, the, uh, uh, on my left is Karen Domfried, who is president of the German Marshall Foundation. And on my right is Elizabeth Sherwood Randall, who most recently was Deputy Secretary of Energy. But uh, what these two remarkable women have in common, among a variety of things, is that both of them were the key person on Europe on the National Security Council. Uh, not at the same time, but uh, if you want to know who was running policy on Europe, uh, you would have to know the words uh, Elizabeth Sherwood and Karen Dumfries. I mean, that those were, that Karen was also the national intelligence officer for Europe, uh, so she has long experience in addition to the NSC experience. And Liz, uh, as Ash mentioned, has long experience in a variety of places, but in particular in the Defense Department, <laughs> And if you want to have a tribute to, um, uh, to Liz Sherwood Randall, uh, pick up Bill Perry's memoirs, the, the former Secretary of Defense, and you will find her uh, uh, properly praised uh, in many places in many ways. So we're lucky to have two such able people with such relevant experience. And uh, we were going to have them each make a presentation, but they decided at lunch that they would rather have a conversation and that we ought to hold it around the big issue, which we already raised as a group at lunch with Ana Palacio, um, but which has been a central issue for this um, uh, uh, conference, which is what's going on with populism in our democracies? Do our democracies still work? Will they continue to work? And what does that mean for a rules-based international system? Uh, we've seen in the United States a president who for the first time in 70 years has challenged the, that international rules-based framework which was set up after 1945 uh, we've seen Britain uh, remove itself or begin the process of removing itself from Europe. And we've seen a set of, uh, of electoral results in uh, both Eastern Europe and in Turkey in which you have uh, what you might call authoritarian democracy, if that's not an oxymoron, but uh, uh, a case where you have an elected leader, but the liberalism is drained out of the system. And so uh, you have a, 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 a major set of changes going on, and some people would say that it's going to continue. And uh, if you look at the German election turned out all right, but the AFD did better than expected. Uh, the Austrian situation is a bit uh, questionable. Uh, French turned out all right, but uh, we don't know how long. Uh, so there is a, there's a set of anxieties or concerns 
that, uh, that cut across a whole series of, uh, of issues that are central to this uh, conference. And I wonder uh, if I could ask each of you to uh, uh, tell us how the world looks from your point of view around those issues. Anna started us on this, but uh, there's still a lot to be led. So, Karen, let me turn to you first, since you were next on the agenda, and then Liz, I'll turn to you next. Well, first, it's great to be here, and it's wonderful to have Jonai chairing this session. And I think you put a lot of really difficult issues on the table. And in a sense, the fundamental question is what happens when liberal democracies produce illiberal results? And I think we're trying to deal with that question in the transatlantic community. And it's certainly fundamental to the question about what Europe's future is and what the future of the transatlantic relationship is. And when I think about the future of Europe, I do think the role of the United States is critical in this. And it sometimes does help to understand the present when you look at the past. And this Europe that we're talking about, I would argue, would not exist were it not for the policy that the United States pursued at the end of World War II. The US used the tremendous power it had at that moment to create a web of multilateral institutions, but also to encourage European integration. I, mean, I run an organization called the German Marshall Fund of the US. It was built out of a generous gift from West Germany thanking us Americans for the Marshall Plan not only for helping to rebuild Europe's economies, but for having included the former enemy in that group of countries. And if you look at the way that the European Recovery Plan Authorization Act was amended in 1949, it was expressly to show US support for the integration of Europe. So you know, we think about that past, and that period of history, which I would argue is a stellar example of enlightened American leadership. And this is by no means a partisan comment. Remember in that period, you had a Democratic president and Republican isolationist majorities in the US Congress. Mm -hmm. Yet a bridge was built. Arthur Vandenberg, the Republican senator who chaired the Senate Foreign Relations Committee was on that bandwagon with Secretary Marshall and others making the case across this country that it was in our national interest to spend 12% of our national budget on helping to rebuild Europe. Now, you look then at the ensuing 70 years, and it's not the transatlantic relations were always harmonious. There were lots of very serious disagreements, whether we think back to the Suez crisis, a US president preventing, essentially, Britain and France from pursuing military action. You remember the Euro missile crisis in the 80s, NATO's double-track decision, and the fact that a West German government of Helmut Schmidt fell because the left wing of the Social Democratic Party did not want the US deploying intermediate and nuclear forces in West Germany. And we know how that story ended. Or the Iraq War, where President Bush was not on speaking terms with French President Chirac or German Chancellor Schroeder because they opposed that military action. So it's not that we've always agreed, but that underlying belief in this international order that we built together after World War II remained, and we always found the way back. And I think what's so concerning to many Europeans today is the question about whether this is a policy difference that they're facing with the US administration of, of President Trump, or whether it's something more fundamental. And has the US turned away from this belief in this order based on a belief in democracy, free market economies, rule of law, rights of the individual, and instead believes that a closed society better serves US interests, nationalism, protectionism. And this is so different from the challenges we thought we were facing. We thought the challenge to the order was a rising China or an aggressive Russia. 
And in fact, part of the challenge is coming from within our own societies, whether that's here in the US or whether it's the rise of populism and nationalism across Europe. And so the challenge for us is if we think open societies in that liberal order remain in the US interests and do capture the values and principles that we believe in, we actually have to stand up and defend it. And we can't take it for granted anymore. And I think that's something really important for us to remember and for our European allies to remember. Uh, Karen, before I turn to Liz, let me press you a, a, a little bit uh, with a couple of questions. If you look at the recent polls taken by the Chicago Council on Foreign Relations, they show that 62 or 3 percent of Americans uh, still hold internationalist attitudes. Uh, what's more, you get majorities in favor of trade, mm -hmm. despite the conventional wisdom that, uh, that we've gone fully protectionist. Uh, NATO has support of the great majority of Americans. Uh, so how much is it, without getting into partisanship, but just as thinking historically in an analytical sense, how much is it that America is turning away from this 70-year history? And how much is it that we had a strange blip historically in 2016, um, which uh, the candidate who held views that were different uh, was elected, uh, and that if 300,000 people had voted differently in three states, mm -hmm. uh, we wouldn't be having this conversation, or would we be having this conversation? I'm, I don't think it's a partisan discussion, because I actually don't think this is a partisan issue. And you know that would open up a whole debate about whether Donald Trump is actually a Republican. But the issues you highlighted, trade and NATO, are issues that establishment Republicans have been very strong on. I mean, it's actually the Democratic Party that has raised concerns about free trade agreements and whether they appropriately protect environment and uphold labor standards. So it's actually it's, it's beyond partisanship, I think, and, it, it, and you can question whether this is an aberration, but I, I don't think we don't know the answer to the question of a, whether a post-Trump America looks like a pre-Trump America, because damage is being done to these institutions. There's no question in my mind about that, and it seems to me that we do need to rebuild a consensus in this country about majority support, not maybe in the population, but in the governing class in support of a free trade agreement. I mean, the fact that President Trump chose not to pursue the Trans-Pacific Partnership sent a message to Europeans that there was no hope that the transatlantic trade and economic partnership, transatlantic invest, uh, trade and investment partnership was going to be pursued by this administration. We now have a NAFTA that will be either re renegotiated or scrapped, which has enormous implications, not only for Canada and Mexico, but for our European allies, because of the inordinate amount of European investment in this country that depends on that single um, supply chain across these three North American countries. So the implications of what happens now, I think, do matter. I don't think there's, you can make the case that America as a country has moved away from supporting this order. But because we are the dominant power in the system, how we conduct ourselves and the choices we make will carry implications beyond these four years. I was in, as I mentioned, I was in Ottawa over the weekend at a meeting with a group of Mexicans and Canadians talking about NAFTA that you've just mentioned. And one of the Mexicans there, who a very distinguished person who had been a minister in the government and had actually been a negotiator of the NAFTA treaty, said the great sadness that he had about this was not just the money that was being lost in terms of trade that would be disrupted, but that the Mexicans had seen this as a reorientation and modernization of Mexican foreign policy getting away from the fixation on anti-Americanism. He said what strikes him as devastating 
is to see the re-emergence of anti-Americanism in Mexico. Do you see anything like this happening in Europe, or in Germany in particular, but in Europe, which is a sense of, you know, these Americans aren't what we thought they were? Absolutely. If you look at favorability ratings of President Trump in a country like Germany, he's about 9%. And that is quite similar across Western Europe. There is an important division within Europe. And I think it's not surprising that President Trump made a visit to Poland. And it was in Poland that he reaffirmed US commitment to Article 5 of the NATO Treaty. You'll all remember that during the campaign, President Trump had talked about NATO being obsolete, and at the NATO leaders meeting in Brussels, he had not reaffirmed that US commitment. So there was this pent up demand to hear the US president say those words, which he did. But we also know that he's continuing to beat the drum very hard on our European allies spending 2% of their GDP on defense. And we just heard Ash Carter say he carried that message to our European allies. It's not a new message. It's a rather longstanding message on the part of American presidents and American secretaries of defense. But because President Trump is so unpopular, it's actually making it harder for many of our European allies to meet that commitment because, and you'll see this in Germany, now that you have the Social Democrats who had been part of the Grand Coalition government together with Angela Merkel's CDU and her sister party CSU, now that the Social Democrats will be in the opposition, they are already saying, this idea of spending 2% of our GDP on defense doesn't make sense. And they're campaigning against a position that they had supported and agreed to when they were in government. So the politics of the moment absolutely is influencing the policies of the moment. Can I just add, I'll jump ahead just to say, I think it is unbelievably damaging to transatlantic relations that America cannot be counted on. When we form alliances, we make commitments that provide predictability and certainty in an uncertain and threatening world. And what has happened has moved our allies to state clearly, we can't be counted on. Angela Merkel said this in May. It was so striking when she came out and basically said, Europe needs to take care of itself. We can't look to the United States anymore. That is a staggering change, and one with enormous implications for our role in the world and the advancement of both our interests and our values. And it Sorry, but uh, you know, I think that there had been a view that alliances are something enduring. And now what President Trump has brought to this equation is a view that alliances are actually transactional. Mm -hmm. And it's what have you done for me lately? And depending on that, that will determine how I respond to you. So that's a fundamental shift, and it actually connects to something you said, Joe, which is about where is the United States as a whole. You also increasingly see subnational actors in the United States standing up saying, uh, actually, we don't agree with the position that President Trump articulated, say, on withdrawing from the Paris Climate Agreement. We as California, we as this coalition of Northeast liberal states are going to continue to adhere to the Paris Agreements. And if we all listen to NPR this morning, we heard Governor Brown is on his way to Bonn, Germany for the UN Climate Conference. So it's interesting because it is adding another layer to the transatlantic relationship that has never been built out in that way of European national leaders looking to do business with American subnational actors at the state and city level. Let me, let me just add a footnote on that, Karen, then I want to turn to Liz to give us his perspective on the larger question. But um, if you look at American soft power, what you find is there have been times in the past when we've lost it. And <laughs> Vietnam was a good example. Mm -hmm. When people mm -hmm. were marching in the streets to oppose the US government, uh, we were pretty unpopular around the world. And yet the interesting thing is that the marchers didn't sing the Internationale that Ho Chi Minh would have preferred. They sang Martin Luther King's We Shall Overcome. And so the argument that some people make is that 
American civil society creates soft power, not the American government, and that the types of things you just mentioned will preserve the U.S.-European relationship because of the interconnection of the civil societies. Um, but if you take that comment that I mentioned by my Mexican friend, he would say, uh, yes, but. In other words, you're beginning to lose some of that because for a populist politician like uh, Lopez Obrador, who is a candidate for president of the Moreno party in Mexico, anti-Americanism is a great platform. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know, we may come through this all right, we may not, but do you, do you detect uh, a populism, for example, in, in Germany, but could be elsewhere, in which politicians, most people are in one direction, but politicians are saying, here's a good platform. platform. Mm -hmm. Well, two comments to that. I think that Europeans absolutely are looking at American civil society. Mm -hmm. And I have so many European friends, colleagues who say, we really see this as a stress test for American democracy. <laughs> And we're watching how your media is responding, how your court system is responding, what Congress is doing. So I actually think it's encouraging people to look more broadly at what are the constituent parts of the US democracy. And of course, the president is a critical figure. I mean, there's no one who has a larger bully pulpit in the world than the US president. But there is a much greater diversity of our democracy that I think is getting notice. And to, to your second point about, you know, is this providing a platform for populists in Europe? Interestingly, I think some of what we've seen this year in Europe has been a reaction against Brexit and Trump. And I think uh, there was a concern in the Dutch election earlier this year in March that um, the far right party there, the party Fiat Vildas, would end up being the largest party in the Netherlands. Now, he did better, but they didn't end up being the number one party. And people thought, hmm, that may have been a reaction against the tumult that Brexit and Trump have set off. Then you had the French election. And Marine Le Pen did very well, I mean, receiving over more than a third of the vote, much better than her father had done. Uh, but as we all know, Macron won. And then in the German election, uh, you know, we saw for the first time a far-right party come into the German parliament, not just cross that 5% threshold, but be the third largest party in parliament. So you see these populist forces going up and down. I mean, since then, we've seen an election in Austria and an election in the Czech Republic that would come down more on the populist side of the ledger. So I think you're seeing reactions across these countries and across the Atlantic. And the verdict is not out. I mean, there is an opportunity for Macron and Merkel to, as Juncker said, put wind in the sails of the EU. But there's also much to suggest that these winds of populism that are challenging the American system are going to lead the European Union to be able to maybe not do much more than the lowest common denominator. I think we don't know the answer to that. Liz, let me turn to you for your reaction to the basic question. You and I uh, were together at a meeting in Aspen this summer which looked at the future of a rules-based international system. And uh, what's your prognosis? So thank you, Joe. Uh, what you didn't note in the introduction was that you trained me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I am always awed and humbled to be in your presence. And I have chosen to, we had a discussion this morning about whether academics should take the risk of putting themselves in the arena, what the responsibilities were of academics to do that, and what, what would the consequences be for their career should they do it. I made that perilous choice, realizing I could never be Joe Nye. I chose to try to spend my life translating ideas into action. And, here I am today. Um, I, I'll make three points in honor of Stanley Hoffman, founder of the Center for European Studies. Uh, first of all, I think, and he would have said this, history matters. Anna said this earlier in a different context. But I do think, as we look at the history of the Atlantic Alliance, and Karen has illuminated some of this, um, we have to be cognizant that the glue of the alliance that held it together for so long at times of great stress on the alliance 
is no longer the same as it was. Now, Ash Carter described a resurgent Russia and the threats that it presents, but we don't have the sensation, at least not yet, of a complete return to a Cold War standoff between the United States and the Soviet Union. That's what kept us together, and when we looked at the uh, impact on American leadership when we had a Vietnam, for example, or a number of other crises in the history of the alliance, ultimately the alliance hung together. I think we're in a different time now. And so the first thing we need to do is look at the threats we face uh, and assess whether those threats motivate us to stand together or fall apart. And that would lead me to my second point, which is that uh, and this was something President Obama said from the very start, we are stronger when we stand together as liberal democracies. So if we look at the challenges we're facing, we talked about some of them this morning, economies that have faced uh, extreme stress over the last eight, nine years, rising income disparity in many of our countries, perception that the game is rigged, perpetual underclasses facing a lack of opportunity, though that was challenged in, by, by some of our uh, speakers this morning, a future of work in question in all of our economies. What does work look like in an increasingly automated, digitized, technologically advanced age? Refugee flows challenging our humanity, terrorists threatening our way of life, and nation states building arsenals that could obliterate the planet. So if you stack those up, you'd say, well, yes, <laughs> there are exigent threats, threats like the Soviet threat. They don't manifest in the same monolithic way, but we have every reason to stand together and the fact is that we can't solve any of these problems on our own. So I come to this with the keen sense that despite the many cleavages right now in our own country, in, in European countries, and in between us, that we have to find a way forward together. And that leads me to my third point, which is a conclusion of my uh, observation of the practice of uh, international statecraft over the last eight years, and, and more than that, which is that the world does not self-organize. And as Richard Haas has, has written in his recent book on the world in disarray, American leadership is indispensable. And so if we lead poorly, the world is not actually going to move in a direction that advances the shared interests of liberal democracies. So we, we as I said in point two, we need each other, but also we need to lead. And when I look at the uh, agenda that we pursued with our European allies from the very start in the Obama administration where the principle uh, that we set forth was uh, everything we do in the world we need to do in conjunction with our allies, whether it's addressing climate change, addressing the Iranian nuclear threat, addressing the implications of the Arab Spring. We have to do it together, and we need to go through NATO and through the national capitals in Europe in order to achieve our goals. What we are seeing right now is asynchronous, obviously. We have a situation in which the, the view is that we can go it alone, and you'll either, as Bush once said, be with us or against us, but that doesn't appear to be the outcome. And so my great concern now is that we find ourselves facing that list of of threats, and we could list many more, and that we will not hang together in the face of them and that America won't lead in response to them. And I'll just close by saying that, Joe, many, many years ago, you wrote a prescient book about power and interdependence in which you described a world that was increasingly interdependent. And if that was the case several decades ago when you wrote it, uh, it's even more so today on so many of these global threats that we face. And so it's imperative upon all of us to stand up and to animate that civil society that you mentioned, Karen, where our European allies see us as having a vibrant civil society. But for those of us who are Americans, we need to participate in it, as do our friends in Europe, uh, and ensure that as we go forward, our democracies are strengthened and not destroyed. Let me press you a few points, uh, uh, Liz, before we throw it open to the audience. Uh, I agree with you, obviously, about the importance of American leadership, but suppose it doesn't occur in the next three years. Then what? Uh, are the Europeans capable of preserving a rules-based international system without I mean, imagine we should have American leadership. Let's assume for as a hypothesis that we're, we don't have it or we won't yeah. have it for three yeah. years. Uh, can the Europeans step into the breach 
and try to preserve a rules-based system? They talk all the time about a rules-based system. Can they do anything about it? It's hard for me to imagine an effective global uh, pursuit of the issues that we face today without America in the game in a constructive role. And whether that is about the advancement of democracy, where uh, we have been the beacon on the hill showing what it means to function as a multi-ethnic democracy and a, a federal democracy as well, back to Anna's conversation, um, to the uh, economic challenges that we all face, some of which I enumerated, uh, to the military threats that exist. Absent American leadership and given the track record of Europe, and some of what we heard this morning in the dialogue, which I thought was um, emblematic of what I observed in my time in, in the administration between our German and our Greek colleagues, it's hard to see Europe standing alone and together uh, to make sufficient progress in the face of the threats that exist today to our countries. If you, if you think about the post-45 order, there were several strands to it. We often lump them together and call it the liberal international order. But there was a security strand of alliances. There is a strand of economic institutions, the Bretton Woods institutions. There is another strand relating to human rights and democracy. Um, the security strand seems to have done a little bit better than we feared. NATO, after having been obsolete a year ago, became not obsolete by April of this year, which is really quite a remarkable turnaround in such a short time. <laughs> Doug Lute has left, but I right. uh, give Doug a lot of credit for such a short turnaround. And we modernized our nuclear arsenal in six months, too. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but anyway, the point is that on the security side, uh, the threat to the order uh, wasn't quite as bad in practice. But on the trade side, uh, it's... it's uh, we haven't begun to see the it's, full. It's catastrophic. It's, it, and you know, TTIP is gone. T, uh, TPP is gone. TTIP is uh, basically cool gone. They're in storage. Uh, and uh, the WTO system may be broken by by the fact that we're not appointing new judges and so forth, and the way we're treating the the NAFTA renegotiations, in which our bargaining position is take it or leave it. That's called bargaining. Um, and that could have catastrophic effects on, on trade. And when it comes to human rights, um, you know, what I haven't heard much complaint about Orban or much complaint or about Erdogan. Or Putin. So what, I mean, and this goes back to Dimitri's question, which didn't have time, the Ash yeah. didn't have time to answer. What do we do about situations like Erdogan or like Orban. Well, you lumped a lot in that. So, uh, okay, I, I think that I it's left. not fair, I, but you know. <laughs> you, you, know you left, you left the, with the last answer, I feel that I was pessimistic. So I'll begin with Havel, who said, hope is a state of spirit. So we obviously have to have hope that we can find our way through this. It is damaging to our interests to have pulled out of these trade agreements because our competitors will get the edge on us, and that's particularly true in Asia, where we have seen immediately the, um, uh, uh, a redirection of attention to China. That is, if we're not going to do this big Trans-Pacific Agreement, then countries want to cut deals with China because they know that's a very large market. And that's very, it's not in our national economic interest nor the shared economic interests that we have with our European allies and partners. Um, we need to set an example of how we manage a crisis like the one that we face and the countries in Europe face. And it does require disciplined leadership. And we've discussed the fact that we have states and mayors, cities acting to try to mobilize public 
opinion and to engage internationally, which frankly previously I would have thought was insubordinate behavior by a state or a locality. But now I think it may be that signal we need to send to the world that not all Americans are uh, in agreement with the decision of the United States to withdraw from its international leadership role on such important issues as the survival of our planet. And so I think we do need, as I said previously, to, to act. Now, when it comes to Turkey, Joe, I mean, do, do you want? Yes, we, no, we can, no, we no. Can, This is a subject Dimitri that I've, I've worked on with answer. the Center for European <laughs> Studies uh, for quite a while. Karen also had responsibility for the challenging relationship with Turkey. Uh, it has had its ebbs and flows, of course. I think we're at a very low point at the moment. And it really does reflect a deteriorating domestic situation in Turkey that is very alarming. As a NATO ally, we have a country that has moved as close to authoritarianism as it can be under what these terms, what Farid calls illiberal democracy, right? Elected, but, yeah. but uh, with in, employing terms that, that uh, are suspicious, we can say. So uh, I began the administration with President Obama when the relationship with Turkey was at a very low point, given the um, uh, legacy of the invasion of Iraq. Uh, we made a commitment to rebuilding and repairing and strengthening that relationship. And President Obama invested a lot of time and energy in that, in that relationship. And uh, we faced a lot of challenging issues in the region. Iran was probably the principal concern at the outset of the administration where we had significant uh, tensions with Turkey. But we were able, through an investment in the relationship, to work a number of those issues through to advance our policy goals. That has not been sustainable. And I think the reality is we're really at a potential breaking point with Turkey, where NATO is asking the question, what is the value of Turkey in the alliance? And the Turks are asking the question, what is the value of being in NATO? And that, after more than a half a century of being allies uh, with the largest Muslim country that had been a democracy in NATO, is of enormous implication for our future. And uh, if I were still in government, I would argue uh, actually against what was said this morning by one of our panelists who uh, thought that we should cut off all exchanges and not send academics to countries that have moved to, it, we were discussing Hungary and Turkey, for example, we shouldn't be, have lots of contact, we should isolate them. I actually am of the opposite view that in a circumstance in which you see a country that you worry is going in the wrong direction, you should flood the zone. You should get in there, you should be present, you should be up in their faces, you should do everything you can to use every dimension of the relationship, academic, cultural, political, economic, and military, to pull them back from the brink. And frankly, that's what you know, we need to do among ourselves with the other countries uh, that are at risk, because to isolate them only allows their leaders then to, to cut the country off from the kinds of influences that would pull them back from the brink. One last question before we throw it open to the audience, and that's about China. Uh, the Europeans talk about a rules-based system, and yet China flouts the law of the sea tribunal uh, uh, decision that uh, claimed that uh, you cannot pour sand on an atoll and call it an island, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the Europe, the Europeans haven't really done much about that, but if they're serious about global rules, shouldn't they do more? In the meantime, China has turned Piraeus into a wholly owned subsidiary of a Chinese OBORP, the uh, One Belt, One Road. Uh, so the Chinese essentially prevent Europe from taking common positions which may be awkward to China by buying off various European countries so that Brussels can't do much. And in the meantime, they promote one belt, one road, and buy facilities uh, which give them leverage. And in the meantime, the Europeans talk about a rules-based system and don't do anything about it. Uh, what should the Europeans do about China? 
I couldn't have said it better, uh, Joe. And I think when in the first uh, term of the Obama administration, we saw that it was actually quite difficult to get our European allies to pay much attention to Asia. They're very consumed with the Eurozone crisis, of course, and very internally focused. And we were left to manage the dynamic with China, Japan, Korea, North Korea, et cetera, with the exception of trade missions. Uh, and I think in particular, um, Angela Merkel was quite shrewd and, and identified China as a very important market and, and was engaged, but really principally on economic issues, not on security issues, not on issues of democratic practice or rules, the norms of a rules-based international order. It has only become exacerbated in the last five years. And what we see, what I saw in my last years in the administration was a very, very deliberate effort uh, on the part of the Chinese to uh, secure through uh, their um, economic policy, if possible, uh, that is overtly to secure opportunity, as you described it, the one belt, one road uh, policy, but also through uh, less overt means, if necessary, the advantage technologically and militarily that would position them to be dominant in the world. And we are not as a collective, that is the United States and Europe, organized to meet that. Um, we haven't actually faced a challenge like China in the West. And Ash has spoken about this. Uh, so I'll give credit to Ash on this thought, which is that the uh, Soviet threat was a very different one. It was a closed economy. It wasn't an economic rival to us in any way. In fact, it was the guns versus butter trade-off, all focused on the military strength and very weak economy. The Chinese are a very uh, growing and powerful economy and present us with challenges that we don't actually have yet a toolkit to meet. We don't know how to match that. So for example, I have a son at Stanford. He's a junior. He's an engineer. He's being recruited actively uh, to join Chinese companies, which are looking to suck up the best and brightest of our talent and outcompete us. Uh, that's, a, that's a deliberate strategy uh, supported by the government. Scientists are being set up in big labs in China to beat us in CRISPR-Cas9 and gene editing technology or in any supercomputing, you name it, whatever's on the cutting edge, they're trying to get ahead of the edge. So we actually need together, the United States and Europe, to have a strategy to match that and to meet the challenge and to find ourselves on the other side of this period of such turbulence in a leading position rather than behind. Karen, do you want to say anything about China before we sure. throw it open? Sure. You know, what, I, what it makes me think about is, you know, your comment that, well, maybe the American public at large isn't behind some of these America First policies. But as we know, vacuums don't remain vacuums. Mm. They're filled. Mm -hmm. So when the U.S. today is making decisions to step back from leading globally, TPP is a really good example of that when we're talking about an economic relationship with Asia. And we saw the EU then immediately <laughs> conclude its trade agreement with Japan. I'm not sure that would have happened so neatly had TPP gone forward. So you see the Europeans realizing they want to try to help fill that vacuum, but they can't make up for the weight of the U.S. in the global system. Mm -hmm. So our absence there does matter. Your example of Greece with the the Port of Piraeus is another really important one of how any time yeah. there's an opening, the Chinese are ready to fill it. Every UN position that we are vacating, the Chinese are putting people up to fill them. So I think that facts are being created because of the role the US is choosing not to play in the world right now. And you know where this leads us, I actually think there might be an opportunity here in the US-European relationship because I think many, if not most European leaders, do believe that 
there isn't a West they can imagine that the U.S. is not mm -hmm. playing a leadership role in. So whether it's Macron inviting President Trump to Bastille Day to mark the 100th anniversary of the U.S. entry into World War I, whether it's Angela Merkel after her Oval Office, office visit inviting Ivanka Trump to Berlin in advance of a G7 meeting, they're trying to figure out how to build a relationship with the U.S. And I do think that President Trump worries about China. And there may well be some discrete projects on China where you could have transatlantic cooperation, whether it's around how do you protect intellectual property. And it, so it seems to me that this is an area where we should try to be creating some constructive ideas where Americans and Europeans can work together to stand up for the values and principles that we believe in. Well, just to pick up on that, Karen, I think we heard this morning from our um, uh, social science uh, center in Berlin that there is significant federal, continuing federal support in Germany for research and development, even if in the United States it's being cut way back. So I would say there, here's an example of something we could do. We could do more collaborative work, research and development in the most important scientific domains in which if we are able to advance, even if the United States funding is declining, we will sustain that edge. I mean, it would be to look for ways mm -hmm. that we can build uh, outside of government more potential collaboration uh, with our German partners and with others in Europe who are willing to make those investments. We've heard Macron say to American scientists when the funding, when the U.S. budget proposal came out and there was a slashing of the science and technology research budget uh, proposed by President Trump, uh, Macron said, we invite all of you, your scientists, to come to France and do your work in France, which made people laugh as you're laughing. But also, I thought he's so shrewd. And what we should mm -hmm. be doing, of course, is doing it collaboratively. Mm -hmm. Well, let's throw it open. Uh, questions from the mm -hmm. audience? They're back, uh, halfway back. Um, I guess I have a very different perspective than the perspective you Can you, you introduce all. yourself? Yes, so we uh, know you Richard Rosen. I work on economics of climate change. But my question is broader. In listening to you, as I've listened to many talks from the Washington sort of Swamp. think tanks about uh, <laughs> you know, US uh, strategic interests, US values, all this, you act like we all agree. We, we don't agree at all. I hope there are many people in this room that completely object to current uh, U.S. actions, particularly, you know, our military aggressiveness, you know, starting uh, after World War II with the Korean War, the Vietnam War, et cetera. A lot of us were in the anti-Vietnam War movement. Um, you know, a lot of us support peace, not war. I see you all still talking about making uh, uh, the U.S. and NATO an aggressive military operation. A lot of us think that war in the Middle East wouldn't have been nearly so possible if we hadn't shipped weapons to people on both sides. If you don't manufacture weapons, if you cut back your military uh, industrial complex, people can't shoot at each other if they don't have guns. So there are a lot of assumptions that you're making about consensus in the US, even among, quote, liberal democratic thinkers that are just wrong. So I mean, I'll just, excuse me, I'll say I don't make any assumptions. No, what no, I'll you say do. is that you, if you, if you uh, posit that our disarmament would have led others to disarm, there is literally no evidence of that. Well, I don't and think, so I don't, there's a lot is, of evidence, though, that American aggressiveness over the last 50 years has caused mm -hmm. a lot of terrorism and war, okay? I don't think we should have 174 military bases, maybe four. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the, there's huge disagreements between people, I hope in this room, that would be for the peace movement or for a new peace movement that was strong like it used to be, and, and the rest of you, because there's no consensus about what U.S. strategic interests are. There's no consensus about American values. You tell me what values you support. I support peace. I support economic development in China. Just a second, please. You, you objected to the fact that your son was being solicited by uh, organizations in China. The U.S. has done that for decades. So if we can solicit the best talent here, why shouldn't the Chinese? Why should we be against Chinese development? Why should we make it into an issue of competition? Everything is always competition. Why don't we get to more cooperation with 
Chinese development, development in India, development in other poor countries, et cetera. So there's a lot of assumptions without my talking anymore, which I've said enough, th th that well, are just wrong yeah. that you guys Listen are making. And, uh, Karen. Yeah, thank you. So uh, what I was trying to describe uh, is that if we're absent, the world does not, as I said, organize itself to reflect the values that you are describing. Um, of peace and cooperation. And indeed, what we see is intensive competition. And I would like to see us be uh, interested in supporting young scientists in the very same way that the Chinese are interested. That was my point. It wasn't that they shouldn't, it's that we should. We're not showing that we are looking out in the future and organizing ourselves to support innovation in a way that will allow us to continue to provide jobs and opportunities for the American people and the same challenges present themselves in Europe. So that was the, the uh, logic of my argument. Karen? So my response would be that I think we in this room could have a very active debate about specific policies the US has pursued and whether those were effective, just, whether they were in line with the values we've articulated. So I think you can have a big debate about that. And that's actually what I want us to protect. I want to protect a way of life that leaves space for vibrant debate and an active citizenry. And I also want to live in a place where it's a rule of law that determines my ability to have that freedom of speech and freedom of action. And you know, when I think about the sweep of world history, the past 70 years, I would argue are anomalous. And the world as a whole has achieved, I mean, when you think about the hundreds of millions of people that have been lifted out of poverty around the world over these past seven decades, there's been a lot of good things that's happened over these past <laughs> 70 de seven decades, as well as some things that maybe we don't think are so good, or where there be disagreement on that. And the thing that has made these past seven decades anomalous, I would argue, has been the role the US has played in the world. So that's why I express some concern about what happens if the US doesn't play that role anymore. And we can have a debate about that. But my argument is not based on specific policies. It's been based on a dominant power in the system espousing values, which even though it hasn't always lived up to those, has done better than any other, I would say, benign hegemon in the history of the world as we know it. Other questions? Uh, yes, in the second mm -hmm. row. Thank you. Um, Philippe Lecour, Belfast Center. Uh, two questions, one on uh, Europe uh, and one on China. Um, on on um, on Europe, um, Karen. I'm wondering whether, if I can, continue your uh, uh, your sort of half uh, uh, half full glass uh, uh, narrative. If uh, we could uh, assume the Europeans are able to put together uh, their own policies and uh, a better defense, which has been sort of criticized by the U.S. for. I mean, the Europeans have been criticized for not doing enough. Isn't it a good moment for, for them to, to do this and to show that they, they can actually do it? I mean, this, this summit is about the future of Europe. It's not about transatlantic relations, by the way. Um, this panel is about transatlantic relations. Okay, fine, <laughs> fine. It's not that. <laughs> Sorry, I missed the morning, my, foot, <laughs> my mistake. Um, on, on China, um, which Professor Nye addressed, and uh, something I, I'm trying to follow closely, um, what can we actually do to cooperate uh, among Europeans and the United States? Concretely, I mean, it's all very nice to want to have a discussion, but on what? On what can we actually uh, have a dialogue on China's global rise? Because that's, that's what you were addressing. I'll give an example to you. It's a very concrete example. Um, it, over uh, uh, as the climate has warmed and the uh, pathways through the Arctic have become more accessible to uh, ships. We have seen a huge uptick in Chinese traffic up in the Arctic region. And our Scandinavian allies have come to the United States to our official, in official channels and said, 
What should we do about the fact that there's so much more of a Chinese presence? This is obviously not territory which China is contiguous to. Uh, and they're seeking to buy up a lot of real estate. Um, and uh, what, what should our collective stance be about this? So I'm going to extrapolate from that to say if we had a meaningful dialogue with our European allies about the question, we're liberal democracies, again, we're open for business, we're interested in trade, what should we do about Chinese investment that could be of strategic significance. If the Chinese want to buy rare earth mineral mines in, uh, up in the Arctic region, is that a good thing? It's beneficial to the economy of the country that they might buy it from, but it could be damaging to our shared interests. That kind of conversation looking at uh, collective uh, interests uh, and the uh, cumulative evidence of what the Chinese are interested in acquiring um, could be beneficial to us, and we could develop a, a shared approach that would help us together to, s to be stronger than if we <coughs> stand alone. Okay. You can extrapolate further from that. And Philippe is incredibly knowledgeable <laughs> on transatlantic relations and European work on, on China, but to your question about Europe, too, Philippe, I'm someone who thinks more Europe is a good thing. So if there's a silver lining about this current moment, it might be that the fact that the U.S. is not as present in the relationship with Europe as it has been in the past, if that can create political will in Europe for Europe to do more, and, and you pointed to the defense area, I think that's a good thing. And, you know, we talked earlier about how the U.S. has long beat the drum on Europeans spending more on defense. I don't think Europeans are ever going to do that because the U.S. is asking them to. They will spend more on defense or step up what they're doing together on defense if they see it as in their interest. And let's remember that the NATO decision that took place in 2014 at the Whale Summit, this was before Donald Trump was president of the United States, it was the Europeans saying, we want to meet the 2% target by 2024 because we perceive a threat from a newly aggressive Russia on our eastern border. So I think it's all to the good if the Europeans do more, whether it's in the defense field or in the trade field or in whatever area you, you point to. I, I, we've run out of time, but I might just quickly add a, a point or two on, on this, which is Europe and China are actually working together uh, in ways that are very helpful on climate. Mm -hmm. I mean, the United States is the, is the odd oh, one out, and our, we have dropped out. What's interesting is if you compare Copenhagen, where China was the spoiler, uh, to Paris in 2015, where uh, basically you had a comity of Europe, US, and China under superb French leadership. Uh, if, if that was an example of great success. And then the US yes. became the dropout and the spoiler. So let's hope that the Chinese and the Europeans continue and let's hope they keep a seat warm for the Americans for some point in the future. So that's an example a positive example of Europe-China cooperation. Uh, a second example would be, which one I already mentioned, which is on the law of the sea. Europe has a strong interest. They constantly talk about rules-based systems. How much has Europe done on the law of the sea where China has defied a tribunal which met at The Hague? How much has Europe done about that? Not much, because they don't want to alienate China on trade issues. So there's an example. First example I gave you, Europe picked up the ball. Second example I gave you, Europe dropped the ball. A third example, which is still in play, is rules on cyber. Under the UN group of government experts, uh, Europeans and Americans and Chinese and Russians cooperated on beginning of setting up a set of rules for managing cyber conflict. That broke down this summer. The GGE was unable to reach a report in 2017, although in 2015 they did reach a report which Obama and Xi Jinping took to the G20. It was ratified in the G20. 
So there's a case where U.S., Europe, and China have cooperated successfully, but where it's broken down. So I've given you three examples, uh, and I'm sure there are many, many more, but it's not a null set. In any case, I apologize uh, that we are, we are out of time. There are lots of issues, and we're not going to solve them this afternoon, but uh, maybe with uh, some of the thoughts that have been stimulated by these two excellent speakers, you are going to solve them because your minds have been stimulated by them. So please thank both of you.